Chair Gina Brewer, Michelle Barney, Tamara Hall, Greg Brockbank is on the committee, Frida Zolan, Lisa Max, Geisha, Geisha Cunningham, and I think that's it. I want to welcome our candidates and attendants tonight uh, for joining us, and we will be hearing from candidates uh, for Superior Court Judge, uh, only one candidate, James Chu. Judge James Chu, we will not um, be making a recommendation on him, nor will we be fielding questions to him. He will have three minutes to uh, present his case to, to our group. <laughs> uh, then we're going to go into the Ross Valley Sanitary, where the, we'll have three candidates. Then the County Supervisor for District 2, County Supervisor for District 4, and the candidates for Assembly. The Assembly were last because they're down the street doing another uh, uh, forum. Uh, there are viable women in every election or every race tonight, so we will not be, uh, according to our bylaws, we will not be recommending any men uh, for any of these positions. Um, hopefully the women will show their good side to us and uh, they'll get our recommendation. Um, Eleanor Smith will be uh, uh, our timekeeper. And I have a whistle. And if you <laughs> run over time, she's going to whistle. So if you hear the whistle, you better stop. Uh, for everyone who wishes to ask a, 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 a question for a candidate, please list on the card what race it's for, either supervisor, Ross Valley Sanitary, or assembly. Uh, the cards may be filled out and then passed to either Lisa Max or Greg Brockbank. At the end of the forum, MW PAC members will conduct a caucus and everyone that's not in our group will be asked to, to uh, head out to the lobby. And also candidates will be asked to head out to the lobby, will caucus and make a decision and then take a vote. And count the votes and then come back with you hopefully by 9.15, 9.30 with an answer. Ed, yes? Someone has a question and I have, you haven't got a card, just raise your hand. Yeah, raise your hand if you need a card, or you can raise the card up for somebody to pick it up. Uh, if you would like to vote a, a no endorsement on any candidate, um, you may do so, and your, your, um, your vote will be counted. An extension, your vote will not be counted. Uh, each uh, person that we endorsed tonight has to have 51% of the vote, uh, of the total vote. The <coughs> Ross Valley Sanitary has two positions open, so you may vote for two people in that race. Oh, uh, can we turn our cell phones off, please, so we don't have any interruptions? Uh, I guess that's it. Again, thank you for coming, and uh, candidates, members, and guests for joining us tonight. We'll start off with uh, three minutes early with Judge James Chow. Cho. Chu. Chu. Sorry. That's all right. Where would you like me to stand? Right here. You can, you want to stand or you want to get up and sit? I'll stand. Take the you you want to have some mic? I. Uh, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? All right. Good, good evening, everyone. My name is James Chu, and I'm currently sitting as a Superior Court Judge here in Marin County. I was appointed to the bench in 2010 and actually took seat uh, in January of 2011. Uh, I believe that my training and my experience as an attorney for 21 years qualifies me for my position. Uh, I believe also that uh, as someone who has championed the rights of women throughout my career as a prosecutor, additionally based on my work, uh, my community service work, uh, as a young attorney that I am uh, uniquely qualified to remain as judge here in Marin County. As a young lawyer, I worked with the Asian American Bar Association to bring legal referral service to indigent people in Chinatown communities within the, uh, throughout the Bay Area. 
That was something that was very important to me. I chaired that committee for two years. I also worked as a prosecutor in San Francisco, prosecuting crimes ranging from narcotics to domestic violence to human trafficking to sexual assault. Additionally, I worked in San Francisco on a pilot program that targeted um, people who solicited prostitutes uh, going after the men who targeted the women in an effort to educate those individuals about the fact that prostitution is not a victimless crime. There was a pilot program that was put on in San Francisco. It was organized by then, my then boss, Terry Jackson, who, who is now a Superior Court judge in San Francisco. I also, I also worked as a, an assistant United States attorney in Seattle, Washington, prosecuting violent crime, crimes against, uh, well, hate crimes. Uh, I worked with the Civil Rights Division at that time uh, in Seattle to prosecute everyone from the Aryan Brotherhood, the Aryan family, as well as members of other groups that were hate groups. Um, I focused on going after discrimination in many of those cases. Additionally, once I uh, uh, relocated to San Francisco in the Bay Area to work, uh, I worked on prosecuting cases involving, again, human trafficking, civil rights violations, and organized crime. Uh, I've tried cases throughout the Western United States at both the state and federal level. I've spent the majority of my career in courtrooms, 19 of my 21 years as an attorney in courtrooms. I believe that I'm uniquely qualified. I believe that I have the tools that are necessary to be a good judge. And I believe that's what you want. You want someone who is in the best position to be educated on the law, to be fair, to be impartial, to eval evaluate each and every case as it's presented and then to rule according to that rule of law. And I would ask that you look at my uh, website. I've left some cards up on the table. Look at the people who are supporting me, those individuals who know me best, who have appeared before me in court during the last 15 months and who are endorsing me. I think that's quite a testament to the work that I've been doing. And I ask that you look at my qualifications, my experience, and that you vote for me on June 5th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Marn never, uh, his, the person running against him never uh, responded to our questionnaires or our emails, so I guess he wasn't interested in coming. Uh, next race is Ross Valley Sanitary. It has two positions open, and if the candidates can come up and take a seat. <coughs> Missing Frank Egger, huh? Should we take a five minute cookie break? Uh, me? A five minute cookie break? No. Um, I, I randomly chose who was going to go first, and Mary Silla is first, Marcia Johnson is second, and Frank Egger is third. So hopefully he will come in. Uh, you have a two minutes to uh, tell us who you are and why you're running and why you want our vote. Be sure you state your name clearly because we are videotaping. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Mary Silla and I'm running for the Ross Valley Sanitary District. I first became aware of the Ross Valley Sanitary District in late 2005 when 4,000 gallons of sewage spilled into my home. As a result of that, then director Sue Brown knocked on my door and suggested that I attend a meeting and give public comment about what had happened. When I, oh, <laughs> when I first attended a meeting in the Ross Valley Sanitary District in early 2006, I, I saw what I described to my friends as one of the most dysfunctional boards I'd ever seen, and I served in the nonprofit world for a long time, and I thought I'd seen a lot of dysfunction. Uh, since that time, I've continued to watch the board, and although it's changed and in terms of its membership, uh, I still think that there's a legacy of dysfunction that this board has. Uh, my background is in law and public health. I've been a civil rights attorney for some years and run public health nonprofits more re recently. And what I saw and what I continue to see on this board are folks who I believe in their hearts mean to do the right thing, but because they are willing to pick fights and to uh, wage aggressive battles against entities are actually spending our ratepayer money to with, for lawyers to fight lawyers. For an example, 
when, when the RVSD fights the Central Marine Sanitation Agency, we pay 100% of the lawyers on the Ross Valley Sanitary District side, and we pay about 45% of the lawyers on the Central Marine Sanitation Agency board. So as a rate payer, I'm offended by the idea that we're paying lawyers to fight each other. We also have a staff for the RVSD that is paid much higher than other districts in the agency. And if you saw the IJ editorial this morning, you read that the IJ, which is the newspaper of record for this county, believes that this board is picking fights and saying everyone else is wrong. And I want to end that because it costs us ratepayers money. I think that this board could be served by a more rational, reasoned approach to the provision of the sanitary services that it provides. And I'm the one, I think, who can lead that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Marcia Johnson. I've lived in the Ross Valley for 40 years and raised my family here. I've also served on the Ross Valley Sanitary District Board for five years and have also been on the board of the National Women's Political Caucus. Never in the past 35 years has more pipe been replaced than during my tenure on the Ross Valley Board, which managed to do, even with limited resources available to us, more than 18 miles of pipe. This is an incredible achievement. But it is not enough. We need to do even more. We have at least 100 plus miles of pipe that is in desperate need of replacement. Replacing it at the rate of two, three, or even four miles per year doesn't get the work done in time. That would take 25 to 50 years. We've had catastrophic failures, the most recent of which is the Larkspur trunk line. We luckily discovered it before it could cause environmental harm, but it was a near miss. We should not be operating based upon responding to emergencies, but being able to work our prioritized capital replacement plan. We need to get ahead of the curve so that we can sleep at night knowing our streets, our homes, our district will not be inundated with raw sewage at any moment. I will speak frankly with you. This is the only agenda I have to get the pipes fixed as rapidly as possible. To this end, we are considering a board approved bond paid back over time. So all current and future users of the new pipes would share in the cost. I am firmly committed and have been for decades to the threshold issues of the Marin Women's Pact regarding reproductive choice, affirmative action, comparable worth, pay equity, protection against domestic violence, sexual assault, and ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. I would be honored by your endorsement. Thank you. Frank, you're just in time. <laughs> <laughs> you're the third candidate. Perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Good evening. Two minutes. Well, <laughs> these are tough odds, you know, two against one. But uh, I was appointed to fill a vacancy of Sue Brown uh, when she resigned in, uh, a year and five months ago. And uh, I actually thought, well, this is a pretty good fit. I'll be able to you know, enforce some, some water recycling, reclamation, reuse projects, because sewer water is 11 million gallons a day dumped in San Francisco Bay, and, uh, and that's going to be part of the overall supply system. So I had to run for the water board loss, and this, this wouldn't seem to make sense. Uh, little did I know that the Ross Valley Sanitary District was going to be in the paper constantly. I mean, weekly and oh my gosh headlines 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 and, and so i thought well my years of experience will just bring a little calming nature to the whole total operation and uh, you know i've served uh, for four decades on local regional state federal agency boards commissions and councils from the coastal commission to the mayor of fairfax to golden gate national recreation area border patrol and and, uh, and so i kind of know the ins and outs of, of special districts um, what I've found over the years, special districts tend to tend to kind of be the board members kind of be, tend to be rubber stamps for the for the management staff. Um, it's kind of a go along to get along crowd, and and um, uh, sometimes that's not in the best interest of the of the voters or the rate payers. And uh, and and so I, you know here in, the, in this past few months, there's been some difficulties. Uh, uh, I've been concerned about. Uh, 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 a revenue bond measure, and uh, I believe it needs to go to the ballot. It needs to be general obligation bond measure. Voters have to weigh in on, on, a, on a $100 million uh, project with $100 million in, in, in uh, interest of $200 million. I, I think that kind of a decision needs to be made by the voters, not three members of the board. 
Um, but it's a, it, all in all, you know, it's a, it's interesting, and uh, and, and I, I hope to, to, to retain the seat. So um, I thank you very much for this opportunity. One thing I, I know that the, the uh, we need to we we need to really um, st get into a program where where Ross Lake Center District promotes uh, 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 the hiring of, w of women in, in, in our organization. Thank you. Okay, Gina, would you like to ask uh, Mary the first question? I'd ask everybody, yeah. yeah. <laughs> start off with her, and, off. Then, and then Marsha, and then Frank okay. will answer. Okay. Um, and you'll have one minute to answer. Okay, well, uh, it sounds like there's um, a lot of different points of view on things, and I don't know, since I'm not that familiar with the board itself, um, I'm not sure yeah, I know. <laughs> See, that's yeah, yeah. So it just, in other words, each person is bringing their own perspective, and I don't know how accurate each of those perspectives is. So um, my question is, um, how would you do what needs to be done? I.e. Um, build the uh, 100 miles of pipe, for example, along with other things, um, in the most cost-effective way. What changes need to be made to make the um, district more cost-responsible? So, Marcia? Well, so I understand your hesitation. Uh, I, I don't think that we need to be talking about 100 miles of pipe. If you attend Ross Valley Sanitary District board meetings, Brett Richards, the general manager, will say up, stand up and say, this system is in catastrophic failure. And everything he brings before the board, he calls an emergency repair. When in fact, the board's own policies and procedures say an emergency repair is when something's spewing out in the street, and so we're going to skip the bidding process because everybody agrees we need to get it done now. So I think there's a little bit of a chicken little thing going on here where we say the sky is falling so we need to spend, spend, spend. But this district also spends a disproportionate amount of money on staff, salaries and bonuses and extras, and on legal fees because they're fighting other governmental entities. So the very first thing I would do would be to say slow down stop every single meeting approving literally millions of dollars of emergency repairs saying the system is in catastrophic failure and let's take a reasoned measured approach to how we spend ratepayer monies to improve the sanitary systems Uh, first of all, I just wanted to correct that we haven't actually approved emergency repairs except for one about a year. But just for the Larkspur trunk line, um, they were not approved as emergency trunk uh, as emergency repairs. But 71 percent of our 200 miles of pipe was built between 1940 and 1959. So a life of a pipe is about 40 to 50 years old. Our pipes, the majority of the district, is 53 to 72 years old. So that gives you a little bit of microcosm, the problem. We have tried out some new techniques that I, probably some of you have heard about pi our uh, pipe bursting pilot program we did on both Dean Road and Fairfax, where we found with using our own crew that we could uh, do a mile of pipe for $800,000. This is an, not an open trenching, but an underground tunneling kind of method, instead of 1.4 million miles, I mean $1.4 million that it costs for an outside contractor. So this has been very cost savings for the, di for the district. We also are using uh, other methods called CIPP, cured in place pipe, which is when you go into a pipe and you coat the inside with some kind of hard plastic uh, covering in order to refresh the pipe that isn't really past its, you know, it's completely past its shelf date or has not completely collapsed and deteriorated. Uh, thank you. Okay. Great. Right now, we, we, we don't have a $100 million plan with specific projects and with cost estimates as to how to spend $100 million. And um, I, I've been saying we, we've, got a, we've got a first rebuild confidence in our agency with, the, with our communities. We need to go into the Ross Valley, the cities and the towns, and, and explain what's going on with the sewers. Talk about uh, what, what needs, what's the high priority uh, fixes. And, uh, and we have to have community buy-in. 
And if we don't have community buy-in, uh, this board uh, on a 3-2 vote is going to go out and spend a couple hundred million dollars and, 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 the, and the community will never buy in. I, I, I think we've got, to, we've got to really slow down the rhetoric we've got to, and we've got to go into our communities and sell the project. If, if they see what's wrong, uh, I think they vote for it on a general obligation bond measure. Um, this, this sort of ties into that. Um, the, race, the rates for the Ross Valley Sanitary District increased substantially last year, which has a profound effect on rate payers, especially people living on a fixed income. Do you think it's the responsibility of the directors of RSBD to keep the rates um, at, at a kind of a controlled level um, so people can afford them? Dan Warner? Uh, uh, start with Marcia. Marcia can go first. Okay, good question. Um, Last year, as a result of public input, the asked, public asked us to look at doing a fixed rate, I mean, a, a flow-based system, which means that just like your MMWD bill, part of your property tax bill for sewer rates would be based on your water use, instead of everybody being charged the same amount as a flat amount, whether it's one person in the household or 10 people in the household, obviously them paying the same amount for wastewater services is not equitable. So we did our study, we found out the rates. For many people in the district, under this flow-based plan, the rate would actually go down. And these are the single people on fixed incomes you're exactly referring to, and it was those people we are trying to help. Uh, no longer will somebody in a 500 square foot uh, studio or something be paying the same as somebody in a 6,000 square foot house. And this is about equity and what's called a uh, technical term called proportionality, that you're only charged what's based on the parcel that you use. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. They, they portray we're in as, as, the, as the wealthy community. Everybody's got a lot of money here. We can afford to pay whatever the cost of the services are. Um, if there are a lot of us on fixed incomes, uh, small retirements and Social Security. And to think that within five years we're going to double the rates in the Ross Valley uh, uh, to 1200 a year and in Larkspur to 1500 a year is a little presumptuous. You know, I, I think I think that kind of rate increase needs to have voter approval, and uh, um, the, the the sure we have to fix the pipes, but uh, I, I I don't see us spending that kind of money. I think I think I would like to see us be able to do it for maybe half the amount of money that's being proposed right now. I, I worry about our, our process we're using for to put these projects out to this so-called bid, bid, bid process. <laughs> I think absolutely that the that is the responsibility of the board of directors of the Ross Valley Sanitary District to get public input about these rate increases. We've had substantial rate increases in the past few years, and as Frank points out, the curve is just going up. The, the Ross Valley Sanitary District is a special district that has a directly elected board because we want to have the community have control over the way the rates are set and the money is spent. And right now we have three people, because almost all the votes divide three, two, three people deciding that $100 million in bonds is going to, put out and the, going to be put out and the rates are going to go up. So this election is an opportunity to say, no, that's not what we want to have happen. And as I, I hope you know, the Fairfax Town Council, the San Anselmo Town Council, and the Larchburg City Council have all voted unanimously to oppose the rate increase they as rate paying entities. So I think the other elected officials represent the community sense that we should not have these rate increases continue. Okay, a third question from Tammy to Frank. Do you feel that the Ross Valley Sanitary District is being unfairly picked on by the media and outsiders or is there, is all the concern at least partially warranted? Mm. Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> you know, um, some of this is self-inflicted, um, and, and, and I think we have to make not only peace with Central Marin Sanitary Agency, we have to make peace with the Marin Independent Journal and the Pacific Sun, and uh, um, and we do that by being, being, you know, everybody loves the word transparent. We, we need to be over and above what, whatever you might think transparent is. They have to be kept in the loop. And there are, are, there are, 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 
our way to, to, to communicate with our citizens, not our special little flyer, hot flyer newsletters that go out from time to time. I, th I think we've got to, uh, we've, we've got to uh, change the way uh, uh, we operate so that the public will change the, the way they, what they think of us and how the newspapers will change the way they think we operate. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that uh, the public relations situation of the Ross Valley Sanitary District is based in fact, and that's as somebody who's attended the meetings regularly and also attended Central Marine Sanitation Agency meetings regularly, where uh, the current Ross Valley Sanitary District board members who sit on that board um, are actively aggressive. And I understand that they intend to represent the position of the Ross Valley ratepayers, but I think that it's, uh, it's become overly contentious and now that people just have chips on their shoulders. So I would absolutely try to improve relations with other governmental entities and the Marin Independent Journal. Uh, if you have a good, honest, transparent story to tell, I think that the media will cover it. Uh, and that's part of what I'd like to do if elected to the board. So we've heard already tonight something that has been in the media and will probably be in there again, which is kind of the misapprehension that we actually, if this sounds crazy because we know it's a democratic society, that we are supposed to ask the voters for their opinion before we uh, institute the changes. Our mandates from state and federal environmental laws are just like building codes. You would not ask the public to vote on a building code because it's about public health and safety. The same thing for a sewer system. The sewer system must be made safe for the public health. This is not an issue that is, to me, equivocable. It, not, it must be done. Um, and we are also prescribed under state law, because we are a special district, to use the Proposition 218 rate process. We have no choice in that. We can't go herring off and decide to create our own process for doing something. This is what our prescribed methodology is. Now, it's a state-approved voter proposition. It's not something I necessarily would have chosen, but it's what we are supposed to be doing. Thank you. Thank you all for appearing. Let you know who, who gets recommended, who gets endorsed after. Thank you very much for having us. We're going to follow up. Final? Closing? 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 You want a one minute closing then? Is that okay? Yeah. One minute closing. Uh, Unless there's any other questions from the audience. Can you bring the card up? Ross Valley Sanitation replaced the pipe under the bike path between Marin General Hospital and Kent Middle School. Why? So we didn't really re -dike. There was two new culverts that were put in, and they were put in really by Marin County uh, Public Works Department. The entire project was approved by the county. It's on county land. We did not have any choice about where the berm is located, where the path is located. That's all part of the, of the county planning process. So if something got moved slightly or whatever, that's what the county directed us to do. We do not make choices about redirecting marshlands or whatever. That's way beyond our power, and nor should we be involved in that. Uh, so whatever was designed and approved by the county would have been what was built out. It was part of the Kenfield Force Main Project, which was probably the largest sewer project that's ever occurred in a uh, pipe replacement project in Central Marin in decades. Uh, it replaced a main 42-inch uh, pipeline. Uh, so it was a critical path through Central Marin for wastewater. Frank, do you want to weigh in? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, last um, uh, 
Thursday night as part of the settlement with the Bay Area Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, as a result of that spill that occurred, the spills that occurred at the end of 2010, early 2011, uh, the board approved a settlement uh, that, that will dedicate $280,000 to a marsh restoration project just, just um, south, southeast of Hal uh, Brown Park there. In that very marsh you're talking about, we're gonna we're gonna Im improve the uh, the water movement from from the creek and bay uh, into the marsh and back out, and so that's part of a settlement that that was not uh, foreseen when this first happened, and I think that will benefit that marsh and 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 and, and the tide, tidal action that occurs there. I live on Stadium Way, which is a few hundred yards from exactly where you're talking about. So um, I was affected by the work, and I will say I think. Uh, my experience with the Ross Valley Sanitary District is they certainly spare no expense uh, and that environmentalists generally attend the meetings. So I imagine that they've done the best they can to address those issues and it was probably done in a, you know, in a high profile <laughs> high, high um, profile way and I'm sure it was done appropriately. Thank you very much candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Candidates for County Supervisor District 2, Eva Long, Katie Rice, and David Weinsoff. And uh, Katie Rice has been, uh, I drew names out of the hat. Katie will go first, David second, and Eva third. You'll have uh, two minutes for an opening statement and then. Uh, each person will get one minute to answer each question. Katie? Go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Very nice to be here today. See lots of familiar faces in this campaign cycle. Um, I want to just give you a teeny bit of background and frame it in the context uh, of this forum, um, which is about women and girls and challenges and uh, making the world a better place and an even playing field for, for all people, for all women. I was fortunate actually to be raised in a family where gender was not a predeterminate, a predeterminate of fate or fortune and where everyone in the family was taught how to play pickle and how to fly fish and how to fold the laundry. Everyone was also expected to go to college and everyone was expected to give back to the community. I have had um, the honor of having two really incredible role models in my life. First, my mother, um, who, while she was raising four children, sidelined as a political activist and uh, fought many battles on behalf of this community, both environmental battles and political battles, and ended up also running, um, serving on the Marin Municipal Water District Board and served as the first woman president on that board during the drought um, of the 70s at her peril. Uh, my uh, second uh, mentor, role model, and big influence in my life, of course, Hal Brown, who I served with, who I worked for for the last eight years under the county government. There's four reasons that I was appointed by the governor last fall to serve, um, to replace Hal when he retired. And they are the same reasons that you should um, endorse me today, I believe. I was appointed because I know the district, I know the county, I know the job, and I have broad community support. And those are qualifications that are essential in terms of providing the leadership, building consensus, and getting things done both up at the county on big issues and down at the district level and local level on smaller issues. Um, my base of support is strong and broad because I've worked for 17 years in the community on school issues, working on equity and programming, um, to provide equity in programming throughout the Ross Valley School District and through working with Hal Brown on issues large and small up and down the Ross Valley with players, uh, electeds, neighbors, community members. I built relationships and I built trust and that base has followed me into this election cycle and into this campaign and is with me here today. Um, I would appreciate your consideration and your vote and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. David. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this candidacy is based on experience. 
experience because we are living through, hopefully with uh, under the leadership of President Obama, the last vestiges of the worst recession we've seen in two and a half generations. Experience is important, and in Fairfax, I've been elected twice, six years, six budgets, always balanced, and never a layoff. Equally as important is the whole pension problem that we're having in the county. And it's important to recognize that in Fairfax, the small town of Fairfax, both on the pension side and both on the health care side, as we sit here tonight, we're fully funded. County can't say that. I don't think there are many other municipalities about California these days that can uh, go to bed every night knowing that their retirees on the pension and health care side are fully funded. Third, we really do have to dig into the economics here. Um, in these tough economic times, it's important to contrast what governmental agencies have done well and ones who have not stepped up and met the challenge. Unfortunately, the county failed in the recent Grady uh, Ranch situation, and I would ask that you contrast that with how Fairfax pulled through and managed to bring the Good Earth program and moving our anchor tenant from one side of the town to the other on balance and quickly and within their budget. And finally, it's important that we focus on good economics. Um, I still haven't heard that the supervisors are willing to give up their $100,000 of slush fund money. I haven't heard in these tough economic times when people are struggling that they're willing to give up their car allowance. It's important to recognize that I bring not only six years in government, but an environmental attorney, I have spent two years doing work against predatory lending on the banks. And finally, it's important to know that on the social side, I've also created in my limitless free time the Fairfax Documentary Film Festival. Thank you. Eva? Good evening. I am a long-term uh, Marin College trustee, an educator, and an administrator. I come from very humble beginnings. I'm a native Californian, and I care very deeply about Marin County, a place I call home, where I work and serve. In these changing times, we need leadership that represents the community, leadership that comes from experience, leadership that allows you to question the status quo. I'm going to uh, share with you right now the four or five issues that I think are uh, propelling uh, I as a candidate for um, uh, the future uh, weeks. I think there are four to five items. The first is fiscal responsibility. A sustainable uh, budget is very important. Financial short and long-term planning and fiscal accountability to the voters. And first and foremost, assure public safety and law enforcement. Two, pension reform. That's a linchpin issue in this race because it is a huge unfunded liability. And I'm sure there'll be questions about that that we can further discuss. The third is the quality of life and local control, how we very much enjoy this community, but that's in jeopardy at this point in time. For, uh, planning for the future is absolutely necessary that we maintain the wonderful quality of life we enjoy. Health and environmental concerns that we assure quality of public health and our environment. And then lastly, that uh, the board needs to be able to explore alternatives and options for parks and library services. And most of all, that there be a plan that we work with our economic development people with and that we create jobs, creation, and partnerships. And it's about jobs, jobs, jobs. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gina, you want to ask the first question yeah. to Katie? Okay, Katie. Um, regarding pension reform, how did uh, we get in such a mess? I mean, who was it on the Board of Supervisors who thought it was such a good idea for us to uh, get give everybody uh, a pension that apparently, and lifetime medical and all that, um, and now we're trying to pay for it. So my question is, how can we get out of this um, burden and, and yet still be fair to employees, retirees, 
and the taxpayers? Well, first of all, it was not one decision or one elected, um, and it was a combination of forces. It was decisions made over time um, by, by electeds, and it was um, also some forces outside of our control, including the crash in 2008. Um, things combined uh, to create what we have today in terms of an unfunded liability. We cannot go backwards in terms of, um, we cannot renege on the contracts that we've made with employees. We have to bring, we bring that with us and we, we are obligated to pay the pensions and the, and the retiree benefits that we have promised current and, and former um, employees, retirees. But what we can do to fix it and we get out of it slowly is one, uh, try to create tiers that are sustainable. We are also moving towards with pension reforms that will create a more sustainable system by hopefully um, including the ability to add a hybrid plan in the future that would allow for a defined contribution and a partially defined but not fully defined benefit that will be more sustainable going forward over time. There's other elements that the um, county has adopted, including um, we are just about to establish an OPEB trust. Oh, there's a and we've reduced our liability, I believe, by, I want to say, $115 million over the course of the next 17 years in terms of retiree health. So we've made some good steps. 30 years of supervisors, they saw the pension debacle up ahead, took the ship of state and ran to right into the iceberg. If only the supervisors had one or two city council, town council members on it who have to deal with these problems intimately, year by year by year, as Fairfax had, perhaps the county would not have wrecked the ship of financial state. It's unfortunate, and now we're going to have to spend the next generation digging out from under it. They should have looked at what Fairfax has done for the last couple of years. We created a side fund years ago, in 2007. We got the actuarials, and we put the money aside. Years ago, we created um, a, a pension override tax. And then in more recent years, as we saw economic problems occurring, we created tier twos, we got buy-ins, and as a result, as we sit here today, we're fully funded. The ship of financial state in the little town of Fairfax is something that the county could only imagine and envy. I too cannot comment about the, the history, but I can analyze the fact that there was default leadership. The decision was made on a three to two vote. The two actually, one vote of no and one was an abstention. Uh, some of those people are still present today and are concerned about that there is between a $700 million and a $2.4 billion deficit that is unfunded. Now, the uh, county budget is $450 million. And so I think you can do simple arithmetic with that in terms of what it means if it were to be passed on to tax people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about College of Marin. 2005, every city, every municipality and district was required to state their unfunded liability in their audit. It's nothing new. It's something that each of the uh, boards and, and councils had to deal with. The college, as an example, took it very seriously and said, as we can, we need to fund it. So we can actually bond the, um, uh, if we need to, uh, 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 we need to be able to uh, secure what, what I would call a mortgage, easiest way to describe it, because our finances are in place and our credit is good. Thank you. <laughs> And Michelle, uh, to David, the next question. Okay. Um, what is your opinion about the suggestion that um, the San Quentin prison should be closed and developed? If it is developed, what should happen to the prisoners? Um, um, should they just be dispersed around California um, with overcrowding and all of that? Well, the one thing you learn in government is when you make a, when you plan a mistake and you get out from under it, try not to revisit it and reimagine it again. We all remember Marinello, the idiotic decision um, to place a billion homes on the top of uh, you know the Marin Headlands. This would be exactly the same situation if we were so stupid as to plan to put community after community after community on a tiny little road. The community does not want to have it. There are many places 
at appropriate places to do affordable housing, which is a moral and an ethical obligation, but putting it into such a landlocked place, a location that is more appropriately located for a park or a visitor serving uh, opportunity um, is quite better than that. And I would expect, first of all, you don't push this through on consent, and you don't do it without full public hearing. But the most important thing you have to recognize is the, the land ethic of the people of Marin. And it's critical that on a piece of property like that, an almost unimaginable benefit to the folks of the Bay Area, you set it aside and you put it into public use. I'll, uh, I'll cut through the chase. It should be returned as a natural park. And I have this philosophy that you don't play in other people's sandboxes. It belongs to the state. Um, we don't need to be greedy and grab, have a land grab on this. So return it to a natural park. Secondly, not for development because there are unintended consequences, such as gridlock in terms of the um, roads that lead to San Quentin and into the major arteries. But there are so many factors that would affect the quality of life of people in Marin County and, and elsewhere. Um, well, with regards to closing the um, prison, that'll, that will be a decision that will be made at the state level, though we can continue to lobby and advocate for it to be to remain remain active or to be closed. And there are issues with closing it with that are um, regarding social justice, and there's concern about um, the inmates there having access to some of the social services that they have in, a, in our metropolitan area that they might not should the um, prison be relocated. That said, should the prison be closed, what happens uh, on that property, I think, needs to be um, determined by all the stakeholders. San Rafael, Larkspur, Corte Madera, the county, those jurisdictions all have interest in that area. And either, everyone needs to be engaged, the community groups, the different interest groups, and, um, and some consensus determined on what should happen on that land, whether it's um, significant development, modest development, all open space, what have you. Thanks. Uh, David. Housing. So we have a bag with their arena numbers. We have pushback. We have SB 375 saying we have to regional planning. And what is your personal plan or idea about how we're going to meet the needs that we have with the constraints of the land that we have and the nimbyism that we have. I think if you look at how the little um, municipality rather than the grand county is dealing with it, you have a roadmap to the future. So I would ask you to take a look at the Fairfax, the incubator of wise ideas, and, 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 and see how we're dealing with our ethical and moral responsibility to site affordable housing. We have sited two large parcels, one the old Lutheran Church, um, out on Sir Francis Drake and almost across the street at the old Mandarin Garden site. You have willing sellers, you have an engaged planning staff, you have a council which is digging in, and you see the project moving forward. That's how you go forward. As for ABAG, I do not um, go with the view of pulling out of ABAG. I believe that we have to re-engage them. We have to smart them up a little bit and get them to be a much more competent regional agency. At the moment, they seem to have lost their way. They have certainly angered the Marin community. But we don't walk away from the table, we re-engage, we sit there until the cows come home, and we make sure that these intractable, important problems are resolved. In terms of ABAG, um, I did some historical analysis because the college owns 300 acres of property in the bottle. Uh, I went back historically to look at how that came about because ABAG was in existence at the time. And what I discovered was that um, there's formulas that you can use, and it doubled itself from 17% to 49%, and an automatic another 49%. What happened there was um, when they went to 49%, what I discovered in looking at the data was no one considered the economic condition of that decade or at that time. 
I think that the ABAG numbers are flawed. I think it needs to be re revisited and that the Marin people who stay in it advocate strongly to have that the, the factors and the qualities uh, uh, reconsidered. So there's lots to do in that area. Um, first thing, I, I believe that we all have to be realistic in terms of what we can actually accomplish in terms of creating affordable housing. I, I don't think we can create um, what we need to meet demand. But that said, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Every, every, um, piece of, every, every unit that we can create is progress, and we need to be doing our best to create affordable housing in all the communities and in the right places. That said, I think that the process by which the planning is done to determine um, the local zoning and or design or what the mix looks like is really the, the process around determining that needs to be um, include the engagement of again all the um, the players the, the stakeholders community process can take a long time but if you have good community process and you have consensus in the end you're more likely to have a project embraced and actually implemented and executed in a way that the community can all be happy can we have a one minute closing from each person, starting with Katie? I, my experience in county government goes back to 2004. We have a $450 million budget. I have been working on issues and problems and projects and programs at the county level for the last eight years. There is no replacement for on the ground experience up at the county in, that go in, in the Board of Supervisors setting. That's not to say that I know everything, but I know where to go to get, answer, to get answers to my questions, to get problems solved. I, know I have relationships out in the community. People will work with me. They have worked with me on numerous issues. They have my trust. I have their trust, and we have mutual respect. I've gotten have been in leadership positions at the community level and like working as a, um, uh, on the school's issues, and I've been in leadership capacity working alongside Hal um, as his aide during the last eight years. I'd appreciate your support. Thank you. David? There are issues that just never come up in the kind of debate that we have, and I would ask that one of these days they just allow the three of us to yak um, for an hour or two um, with the community because Think of the things that we haven't discussed this evening. We haven't discussed the graying of Marin. We haven't discussed the opportunity that we need to have more enhanced active funding for childcare. Um, we're not taking care of our seniors um, quite as well as we will. And uh, looking at myself in the mirror, I see great amounts of gray, and I know where Marin is going on this. It's essential that we deal not just with the issues that are in front of us today, but we begin to look around the corner and say, how is Marin going to be um, situated um, 20, 30, 40 years from now and begin to plan out the funding we're gonna need for these essential services. It's been a great honor to appear, again, with, with my colleagues, as always. Um, we've, we've become um, good debaters over the last couple of years, couple of years, couple of, seems like it, the last couple of months. <laughs> but I would ask um, for your support as well, although I recognize this is a woman's forum, and I thank you very, very much for the opportunity to appear and, and share my thoughts with you. Let me end with, I started with experience and um, the, the need for leadership. When you're an elected official, it is not operation. In other words, it, you, you don't tell the staff the, the how. Public policy is about the what. It is about questioning enough that you guide the staff to the proper decision for the community. And so what I see lacking is the understanding by some of the candidates about public policy. And so what I would bring to the table is the public policy experience. Because you have to be able to understand how to get things done when you meet four times a month or two times a month. And, and that takes skill and it takes the ability to bring people together at the strategic times. So um, additional to that, it is about focused decision and focused action. And so let me assure you that if you give me the endorsement and ultimately the vote, that I will get the deck money. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Our next race is for Supervisor District 4, Diane First and Steve Kinsey. And Diane, you were chosen first to go first. Okay, great. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to seek the endorsement of the NWPAC. Uh, my name is Diane First. I'm the Vice Mayor of Corte Madera. I'm a, an East Bay native and fifth generation Californian. Um, I'm also a board member on the Transportation Authority of Marin. Uh, I'm also on the Executive Committee of TAM. Um, I was, uh, the question always comes up, why are you running? Uh, I was urged by many people to run uh, for this race because there's a concern that we need some change. Um, those that were urging me come from different walks of life. They included democratic activists, environmentalists, as well as transportation advocates. The tipping point for me that decided it, when the designation for priority development area for San Quentin wound up on a consent calendar, in my opinion, creating what would be the equivalent of an entirely new town does not belong on a consent calendar. I believe wholeheartedly in transparency in government, in open and honest dialogue, and in public input. Um, to me, that, that was really um, an indication that you know, maybe we're ready for some change in the county at the Board of Supervisors. I've been endorsed by the Marin Democrats, the Sierra Club, and I am proud to say I have the endorsement of every single council member in Corte Madera. They're the ones who know me best. They know I can do this. Uh, I pledge that I will be committed to improve transportation, the environment, and a transparent government. Thank you. Thank you. Good, it, good to be with you, and I appreciate the opportunity to present my own thoughts to um, the women this evening. Uh, I have had the privilege and the honor to represent the 4th District for four terms. It's an amazing district. It covers two-thirds of our county's land mass, over 22 different communities. It stretches from the bay to the ocean, and it is a very diverse community. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The reasons that I feel excited to continue to serve in this capacity is that the role that I've played during that time is to strengthen our community. First and foremost, uh, by working and listening to the various interests that are in the community, the many nonprofits and community organizations, the community centers that form the hub of each of these different communities, collaborating with other public agencies and partners, and looking for efficiencies within our own government to determine how we can work better. In addition to that, I have worked hard to keep Marin County at the very highest level of financial sustainability. We have the highest bond rating of any public agency in California. We are the only public agency that has really begun to make the serious changes that are needed to create a sustainable pension program going forward. Um, we want to keep Marin County in the leadership position that we have had for 50 years around environmental protection. And our board has done a number of amazing things around renewable energy, bag bans, water conservation, gray water programs, and many others. Um, we can and should continue to be the environmental stewards that we have been for the last 50 years. In addition to that, I've taken on a special role because some of the characteristics of my district really highlight the inequities that we have in our county. And I want to continue to address those inequities, create job opportunities, improve the educational disparities that exist, really address racism itself, create equal pay opportunities, and move forward on housing and other health services. Thank you. Gina, do you want to ask Diane the first question? Okay. I'm going to ask the same question about um, pension reform. How did we get in, into this situation? And what can the board do to mitigate uh, future uh, pension obligations? Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm surprised to hear Mr. Kinsey say that he uh, strives for the highest level of financial sustainability in the county because our current unfunded liability for pensions and health care benefits is between $700 million and $2 billion. 
That is more than $2,800 for every man, woman, and child that lives in this county. And the taxpayers are entirely on the hook for it. Sometimes uh, I've heard people blame it on the 08 crash. The 08 crash only resulted in 25% decrease in the assets. This is a huge problem. In 2005, Mr. Kinsey said, there's no problem with defined benefits as long as they're carefully managed. They haven't been carefully managed. Tier, new tiers with lower benefit levels have been instituted, but we have got to sock money away. The county administrator in his new budget has started doing just that, and I entirely support him in that effort, but we've got to do more because, folks, we are on the hook for this. And it is a, a legacy of many, many years of, of inaction and seven grand jury reports. Thank you. Um, you. Your question is has to do with what are we going to do about our pension challenge, and every public agency in California, including Fairfax, but in this county has a challenge to face, and the county certainly has one as well. But of all the public agencies, the county is the only public agency that has supported the governor's plan that does embrace the idea of a hybrid program. We've changed the eligibility levels for retirement to the highest level of any of the public agencies in our county. We've capped the COLAs to begin to control it. We've revised our annual percentage. We are not giving the full share of the membership contribution as is being done in Corte Madera. So we've done specific things. Now, I understand this is a challenge. All of us face it as a challenge. Our pension was fully funded in 2002. We lost about half of the challenge that is raised here in the stock market crash of 2007. And you know, being angry, it doesn't begin to provide us with the answers. I think what we need to look at is which agencies are actually taking steps to address the problem. 